Hello, friends, and welcome to the PrepWell podcast. I'm your host, Phil Black. And if you have an 8th, ninth, or 10th grader with big aspirations like the Ivy League or military service academies like West Point, ROTC, or athletic scholarships, boom, you've come to the right place. My specialty, my superpower, if you will, is preparing families for these competitive programs. I'll teach you what your child should do, when they should do it, and how you can help. So stick around and prepare to out-prepare. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the PrepWell podcast. Today, I have a piece of advice for all of you parents out there. When it comes time for your child to apply to college... And if you have a junior, that means four months from now, encourage each and every one of them to apply to Harvard, preferably early action. Now, some of you might be thinking to yourself, that's crazy advice. What a waste of time. Even if my child is a superstar, isn't Harvard's acceptance rate closing in on 2%? What's the point? And why Harvard specifically? The answers to those questions are yes, Harvard's acceptance rate may actually get down to about 2% this year. And no, I don't necessarily mean Harvard specifically, but rather a school like Harvard. I like the idea of applying to a super reach school that your child considers to be their dream school, even if the odds are stacked heavily against them. It could be Harvard could be Stanford or Yale or MIT or any school that's on your child's radar that is particularly tough to get into. Why should your child do such a thing, particularly with such low odds of getting accepted? These schools are called lottery schools because of the absurdity of their admissions rates, and the odds are just getting worse. This seems like a crazy ask. So what gives? Let me explain. First off, I don't literally mean that I want your daughter with a 3.3 GPA and who chose to skip the SAT to actually apply to Harvard. I'm using quote-unquote Harvard as a stand-in for the type of school that's out of reach for your daughter. I don't know what that college might be. Maybe it's Harvard, maybe it's Boston College or Duke, but I'm sure there's one out there. The reason I like this idea is because preparing your application for Harvard or Princeton or whatever your super reach school is, it forces you to up your game, to do your best work, to do better than you would have if you were applying to a bunch of match or safety schools. And this concept goes back to a quote that my uncle told me when I was in seventh grade that I will never forget. And the quote is, Seldom do we exceed our expectations. Seldom do we exceed our expectations. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you expect to be successful at a certain level, say a 6 out of 10, then it's very rare that you will ever exceed that level and get to a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. It doesn't normally happen. You dial in a six in your head, you do the work required to get to level six, and you end up at level six. The math is pretty straightforward. And if a six represents a middle-of-the-road school, then it's rare that you'll ever get into a school that's beyond that middle-of-the-road school. You'll be stuck at the university of six. Now let's compare that with shooting for a 10 out of 10. That's the Harvard scenario. With this mindset, you'll go into the application process expecting and striving to get into Harvard. And what happens? You sharpen your focus. You refine your thinking. You take extra time to review and proofread. You spend more time talking to your teachers who will write you letters of recommendation. You start earlier. You write more drafts of your essay. You bump up the quality of your extracurriculars. You study more for the SAT. You're essentially changing your behaviors to meet your expectations, high as they may be. 
And if you do this during the college admissions process and you apply to Harvard, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get rejected. That's what the math says. Even if you put in a 10 out of 10 effort, you will in all likelihood get rejected. And what do I say to that? Good. I'm glad Harvard turned you down. I could care less. Why? Because during this process, you learned what it feels like to strive for greatness. You learned what it takes to be a professional with exacting standards and relentless attention to detail. You learned how to write well. You learned how to engage with teachers and your guidance counselor. You learned how to manage your time. You learned how to present yourself in the best possible light. You learned how to sacrifice. You learned how to do research and answer the questions about why this major. You learned how to reflect on yourself, how to think long and hard about your future, to a depth that you would never have reached had you settled for applying to that 6 out of 10 school. And guess what? All of these skills and outputs, essays, letters of recommendation, test scores, will be reused for all of your other applications. That work is not going to waste. It wasn't done in vain. Just the opposite happened. And instead of settling for that 6 out of 10 college with minimal effort, you'll get into that 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 college. It might not be Harvard, but who cares? Applying to, quote, Harvard was nothing more than a vehicle to help you tap into your greatness, your potential. It's not about getting into Harvard. It's about having a vision, a big one, an aspiration to do your best work and to go beyond that 6 out of 10 mentality that you were very close to settling for. And by the way, if you end up actually attending that 6 out of 10 school, that's great too. There's nothing wrong with that. But at least you know that you put in your best effort, that you didn't settle. You didn't mail it in. Because guess what? Your college application will not be the last and likely not the most consequential application that you will ever fill out. I can almost promise you that. This is just a dress rehearsal. There will be many more applications in your future. So you may as well learn how to do it well right out of the gate. Once you experience how to operate at this high level one time, you're locked in for life. You just rinse and repeat that. And if you keep this mentality and continue to shoot for the stars, whether that means applying to grad school or medical school or for a Rhodes Scholarship or a promotion or a research grant or an audition on Broadway, guess what happens? You will continue to achieve well beyond what you would have if you shot for that middle of the pack. And every once in a while, seldom as it may be, you may even exceed your expectations. But either way, you're still a winner. Now, lest you take this episode and my advice too literally, let me offer some caveats and some cautions as you plot your application strategy. Number one, when I say Harvard, I don't literally mean Harvard. Your child's reach school can be any school that they think is beyond their grasp. Again, when I say Harvard, assume I'm saying it with air quotes. Believe me, Harvard doesn't need any more applications than they already have. Number two, if you're taking me at my word and you decide to apply to a Harvard or a Harvard equivalent, make sure you apply early. That is, early action or early decision. And the reason I say this is because, number one, if you have any shot in hell of getting into a Harvard or, if it, or its equivalent, your chances of getting in, though infinitesimal, are likely better if you apply early. The second reason is so that you can take all of your hard work on your essays and your activity write-ups and your letters of recommendation and use them to help build out the regular decision applications or even other early round applications. It's a great feeling when your first application 
represents your best work. The rest of the applications tend to flow nicely from there. Number three, don't spend too much time. I know I tend to go extreme on these things. And I know I've been talking about a commitment to greatness, and greatness takes time. But you can't obsess so much on your, quote, Harvard application that you procrastinate on all the others. That's very common. Students get lost in their first application for months, and it will backfire. You have to use some common sense here. You need to start that Harvard application early enough so that when you're done, you still have plenty of time to use that application to help you with all the others. Number four, I've mentioned this before, I'll reiterate it here. Don't expect to get into Harvard. I know that when you do an incredible job on your application and you give it the care and the attention it deserves and you're highly qualified and you'd be a great fit, that there's going to be a little kernel of hope that you might actually get in after all is said and done. But the bottom line is, at least statistically, that you won't get in. Obviously, there are exceptions because a few hundred students do get in every year. And I'd love for you to prove me wrong. But for our purposes, you're not getting in. And that's okay. Don't expect to get in. Just like you shouldn't expect to win the lottery. Don't set yourself up for a fall by falling asleep every night wondering, what if I get in? What if I get in? What if? Just consider your application a personal growth project with nothing but upside. Number five, the other nice thing about getting rejected from Harvard is that you will see that the world doesn't come to an end. You will continue eating Vienna fingers and hanging out with your friends and surfing and watching cat videos and whatever else you love to do. Life will go on. And that's a good lesson these days. And lastly, don't take this advice so literally that you spend so much time applying to Harvard early that you run out of time to apply to a more realistic college in the early round. You don't want to waste those early round bullets. If there's another college or other colleges that you will want to apply to early, try to work on them concurrently so that the unrealistic Harvard application doesn't crowd out all the other more realistic applications. Let me wrap this up by trying to assign real colleges to this strategy. Let's say you have a son or a daughter who has three college choices. The Ridiculous Reach School, let's call that Harvard, that's the 10 out of 10 school. The Reach School, let's call that Duke, let's say that's an 8 out of 10 school. And then there's a Match School, let's call that San Diego State, that's a 6 out of 10 school. And now I'll remind us of that original quote, which is, you seldom exceed your expectations. Let's see how that plays out. Here's scenario number one. You're not overly motivated to take on this college application process. You don't want to put yourself out too much. So you apply half-heartedly to San Diego State and Duke, expecting to get into San Diego State and assuming that Duke is probably out of your reach. Lo and behold, you get into San Diego State, and you get rejected from Duke. No surprises here, and you ride off into the sunset going to SDSU, and you make the best of the situation. This is what happens most of the time. This is the status quo. Now let's go to scenario two. You're picking up what I'm putting down. You don't want to be like everybody else. You want to use this college admissions process as a personal development tool that will benefit you for life. So you challenge yourself with a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal of applying to Harvard, knowing full well that the odds are stacked against you, but you don't care. You're going to put your heart and soul into that application. And after months of working and tweaking and getting it just right, you submit that early Harvard application and never look back. And you use that application, which represents your very best work, and you repurpose that content into the Duke application, which comes out fantastic. And of course, you also submit your SDSU application, your San Diego State application, 
which takes very little time compared to the others. And lo and behold, you get rejected from Harvard, you get accepted to Duke in an honors program, and also accepted to San Diego State. And you decide to go to Duke. And so even though you didn't exceed your expectations of getting into Harvard, your 10 out of 10, you did better than you would have had your effort and ambitions stopped at San Diego State. And now you're off to become a Duke Blue Devil. Congratulations. That's all I've got for you today, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the continued support. If you know a parent with a 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th grader, 12th grader in high school that might find this helpful, please share the episode with them. You can do that by finding that small box with a tiny arrow pointing up. That's the share button. Click that button. Text your friends the link to this episode. Maybe put a little personal note in there from you recommending that they give it a listen. If you have questions, comments, or an idea for an upcoming episode, don't hesitate to reach out to me by email, DM me on Instagram, check out our blog, Facebook, connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love to hear from you. Until next week, goodbye, good luck, and never stop preparing. This podcast is brought to you by PrepWell Academy. PrepWell Academy is my one-of-a-kind online mentoring program that delivers to your ninth or 10th grader a short, highly relevant video from me every week, every Sunday, in fact, where I give them a heads up about what they should be thinking about to stay ahead of the game. To get these valuable lessons into your child's hands, please head over to PrepWellAcademy.com and enroll your child today.